begin with this question about the, the reward of Lucas. So two questions on that. Question number one is, why is the name of Zimri and Cosby only mentioned now? It's kind of an afterthought, and the names aren't mentioned during the actual story. Question two is, why is the word Shalom with the cut buff? Yes, yeah, so the, uh, let's uh, talk about the second question first. Uh, Pinchas kills uh, Zimri, uh, the head of the tribe of Shimon, or a very hush of a person in the tribe of Shimon. And he kills the Midianite woman that he's with, whose name is Kazbi uh, Basur. And because of this, he stopped a Magefa. There was a plague that was killing thousands and thousands of people. 24,000 people died, and they would have continued to die had Pinchas not taken the law into his own hands. Now, just to, to, in terms of actual halacha, what is the halacha here? So there actually is a halacha Moshe Misenai that uh, if a Jewish man and a non-Jewish woman, very exact, are publicly having relations. Now, publicly means publicly, so it's very rare that it'll be publicly, but they're publicly having relations. So if you are a zealous person, and that means your kavan is for the sake of God, you are permitted to kill them, but only if you do it during the actual Misa itself. Had Zimri separated from Kazbi, you wouldn't have been allowed to kill him at that point. All right, so that's the Chiddush of Kanos, that a Kanoi, the Torah gives a Kanoi a certain license to impose punishment, although a Basin would not impose that punishment after the fact. Now, because of this, Pinchas was given a bris shalom, a covenant of peace. First of all, what, what, what do those words even mean? What, what is a covenant of peace? What is a bris shalom? So the Pashtus is that uh, Pinchas was given a koach, he and his descendants, that they could bring peace between Hashem and B'nai Yisrael, that, that he was an avenue of peace. And Rashi explains, I, I'm, I'm just adding a few information, I'll get back to your question. Rashi explains, that Pinchas did not become a Kohen till after he killed Zimri. Aye, how can you say Pinchas didn't become a Kohen? Pinchas was born from Elazar. And the like, well, the answer is, neither Aaron nor Elazar were born Kohanim. They became Kohanim only upon their anointing. And Pinchas was born before Elazar was anointed. So Pinchas was not born from a Kohen, and therefore Pinchas is not a Kohen, but he became a Kohen at this particular point. Now, it's interesting, the Mephorsha mask, why wasn't Pinchas anointed along with uh, Mo Aaron, with Moshe, with actually Nadav and Aviyah, or Lazar v. Samar? Uh, right, so why Pinchas was already alive? So they say because the halacha is that if a Kohen kills somebody, the Kohen is puzzled for Avaita, even if it was justifiable killing. So had Pinchas been a Kohen when he killed Zimri, he would have been puzzled the Avaita. So Hashem made it that he killed Zimri when he wasn't a Kohen, then he can become a Kohen. Now, uh, your question is that the word shalom in the Torah, peace, is written with a, what's called a vav katua, or a vav katia, a kat vav. Now, there's a machlokis exactly what that means. Different Sifri Torah will have different minagim. Some say it's a partial vav, meaning it's only half as long as a vav. Others say it's a split vav, meaning the length is the same, but there's a split in the middle. Uh, it is called uh, a vav Katua. So the Gemara itself uh, indicates that the Katia of the Vav is as if you read it almost like a Ksiv and a Kri. You read it without the Vav, so that would be Shalem, Shalem, uh, right? And that actually means that the covenant of Pinchas is only if uh, the children are unblemished, but if they have a Mum, uh, they're puzzled to be Kohanim and, and the like. So you read it as Shalem. Uh, other Svarim gave the following point of a Vav Katiya, and they say that the Vav Katiya teaches me that any Shalom that you get by violence will by definition be deficient, be cut up, be cut to us. So it's a remez that even though Pinchas' Kavana was totally L'shem Shamayim, totally for the sake of heaven, Pinchas was not just a hothead who wanted to do violence. There was no one as righteous as Pinchas, but still, when you make your peace based on violence, it's not going to be a complete peace. Katua, it'll be cut up. Right, so that would be another reason why you have a love katua. Interestingly enough, when the Rambam lists the things that uh, are required in the writing of a Sefer Torah, he does not mention the halacha of vav katia. 
and the Achreinim have all sorts of questions. Why does the Rambam hold that there's no such halacha, like exactly how, how that works? Okay. Now, your first question is also a good question, and that is, at the end of Parsha Spolak, the end of last week's Parsha, we actually have the incident, it says, of a man, of a Jewish man is with a Midianite woman, and Pinchas came and he stuck them uh, through the stomach, you know, with a sword. And when you read that, you don't know who they are. It doesn't say who they are, Bichlal. Uh, and yet, only when Hashem rewards Pinchas for his action, does the Torah record the name of the man and the name of the woman. Why were they not recorded at the time of the Maise itself? Why doesn't it say this person, this person, etc.? cetera? You know, that, that, that is a good question. Uh, I think that um, the, the Hezbra might be the following. The great problem of, or the great avla of uh, Zimri and Cosby was not simply the sin that they were doing on their own. They were two people, and that was a chomerdika sin. But it is said that they had a tremendous influence on the rest of the Jewish people, meaning the way the Jewish people were nichshol b'chait is because they saw these chashava people, or at least the uh, Zimri, uh, being nichshol b'chait. And they extrapolated, if it's okay for him, it's okay for us. So maybe the reason why it says ish is to tell me that people didn't just say, oh, Zimri is special and he can break the rule, but they looked at Zimri as a mushal for them. And that is why it was such a korban in which they deserved death. So the Torah tells me the name eventually, but it indicates that Pinchas was acting uh, because Zimri was the exemplar of an ish, so to speak. Uh, or, or you might say it a different way. You might say that the Torah is Meshabeach Pinchas, that Pinchas was not afraid to hit a Nasi. He looked at the Nasi like, like anybody, meaning that's another way of looking at it, that to me, he is like any other person. I'm not going to apply a different standard to him. Okay, yeah. Here's a sentence. As far as we know, none of the victims of the Titan submersible disaster were Jewish. However, assuming that Jews would go down to those depths, well below the level light uh, of the sun penetrates, how would they calculate Zmanim? Additionally, in a disaster like the Titan, where we have scientific evidence that the ship imploded, but we don't know exactly at what depth, would wives of such passengers be allowed to remarry, even though there's no water without borders greater than this case? Yeah, yeah, so uh, a lot of questions. We had the uh, tragedy of uh, the Titan, and uh, as they say, the Titanic took its last victims. We hope, we hope took its last victims uh, so many years after the uh, Titanic. Uh, there were, of course, uh, Jewish people in the original Titanic, but uh, now, although not that many, but uh, in this particular submarine, only five people, uh, there were no Jews. But uh, theoretically, the question would be, if there would have been a Yidin, if there, wouldn't be, if there would have been Jews in the submarine, and certainly they're at a depth in which uh, there is no perceptible sun, moon uh, type of thing, how would they measure Zaman Tfila, Zaman of Shabbos, you know, everything else? How do you measure when you don't uh, see the sun? So the truth of the matter is, this is actually uh, an easier question. Uh, uh, see, the issue comes up a lot. Let's say you're up northern latitudes, southern latitudes. You know, we have six-month days. So there you do have some very, very serious shilas. Here, though, when you're simply straight up or straight down, whether it's an airplane or whether it's a submarine, you simply uh, compute the times uh, based on uh, sea level directly in a straight vertical line up and down from where you are. So that would basically mean that we would simply follow the times of sunrise and sunset uh, at the point of the surface of the water going straight down from where the submarine is. So when you're dealing with a straight up and down as opposed to a longitude or latitude issue, the computation of Zamanim is not so difficult. In fact, for some reason, a lot of people seem to be flying on Shiva Serba Thomas tomorrow. I don't, know, I don't know exactly why. I, I've gotten like five different things about people who are taking flights, and they want to know when uh, you end the fast. And the halacha is you end the fast when it is dark uh, over your air route, meaning you're simply um, you know, kind of looking at when is it dark over the particular point that I'm flying? And that would be the end of the fast. It is not, for some reason, people think, oh, you either go according to point of origin or point of departure, uh, point of arrival. 
Uh, that's not true. It is point where you are. So even if you then fly into daylight, which is possible, you can go from dark to daylight uh, when you're going uh, west, right? Because you might be going maybe faster than the movement of the sun and the like. But so what? Once the fast is over, it does not revive itself. So if it, uh, if it is dark at any point in your flight, uh, you will be allowed uh, to eat at that point, even if it then gets light again. And you didn't even cross the date line. It's the same day. Uh, but, you know, you don't have to. So if you're going to land in New York and the fast is not over yet, but the fast was over for you uh, in your flight, you are permitted, uh, you are permitted uh, to eat. Although I would say because of Marisayan, you shouldn't eat in front of people who are still observing the, uh, the fast. Now, so, so time, I think, would not be such a shaila. Uh, the issue of aguna is a very, very serious issue. Uh, aguna is the issue of the, um, well, today when people say aguna, they often mean a woman who didn't get a get. But the classic aguna of the Gemara is not so much a woman that doesn't have a get, but a woman who the whereabouts of her husband are unknown. We don't know that he's dead. Now, it's true that halacha has very uh, great leniencies in establishing death. We permit one witness, etc. The witness could even be a guy if it's through con you know, conversation as opposed to testimony. But ultimately, you need, a kind, of, uh, you need a, a kind of testimony. And just because somebody is gone, that does not automatically mean anything. Uh, under secular law, there is, in many, many jurisdictions, there is a presumption of death if there's seven years of unexplained absence. So if a guy disappears for seven years and nobody knows anything, the woman is allowed to get married and even if the husband shows up, uh, she's legally married to the second guy. Halacha does not have any type of automatic rule that somebody's dead because of unexplained absence. In fact, even if he was pretty old, we just assume he's still are still around. So this was a major issue. These were a very, very serious Aguna issues in the aftermath, really any mass calamity, in the aftermath of the Holocaust, where we didn't always have evidence of people dying, uh, in the aftermath of the World Trade Center it was a significant issue. It's also an issue when people are uh, taken hostage or kidnapped, like Gilad Shalit. People who are gone, we don't know anything about them. Are we allowed to assume that they're dead? As you see, obviously, in, in a case like this, Baruch Hashem, he wasn't dead, uh, and the like. So whenever you have any type of disaster where no body is recovered, right, you don't have a body that you could match with dental records or fingerprints or DNA, which halacha might indeed accept, but uh, what, do you, what, what do you do? So uh, it is a, a very, very good question. Uh, it be interesting to see the psak on it. I would assume, though, that the tendency of poskim has been that when the scientific evidence is pretty overwhelming, uh, that there was an implosion. Now, an implosion, see, again, there's, there's a certain Talmudic reference. The questioner is actually a, a sophisticated questioner because he throws in there a little bit of a Talmudic reference to water that doesn't have an end. That basically means somebody falls into water, and from where he is, there is no shore that is visible. So if a person falls into the ocean, and there is a shore, so we would be able to, and people were watching, we would be able to see him alight. So then the halacha is, we might proclaim him dead if he doesn't get up after a certain time, because had he gotten up, we would have seen him. But when you have this huge ocean where theoretically he could have come up, you know, 20 miles down, down the current, that's called mayim she'en lahemsof. And mayim she'en lahemsof were choshesh. Choshesh, that maybe the guy, uh, you know, just went beyond our vision range. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, this is Mayim Shein himself. On the other hand, this is not just a case of somebody falling in. I mean, we actually have implosion. A person cannot survive. I mean, God can do miracles, but but uh, a person could not possibly survive uh, that type of situation. So I believe we would uh, permit the women to remarry. Yeah. Why is spirituality so seemingly delicate? Um, as in, we have so many distractions and barriers that can affect our devakis today. Um, is this the nature of, like, uh, Ruchnias, or did it, like, decline over time? Well, well uh, spirituality has always been very, very vulnerable. You know, the Gemara has a beautiful mashal based on Pesukim and Mishle about Torah generally. And Torah, of course, is the key to spirituality. 
that Divrei Torah are as difficult to acquire as gold, but is as easy to lose as glass. That's why Torah is compared to gold and glass. Hard to acquire, but very easy to lose. In fact, the Venus Manim is coming up. Some of uh, you might be leaving Yeshiva. Venus Manim, something to remember. You know, a person, uh, just let me give a little commercial for this. You know, a person works very hard the whole year to grow in Torah and in mitzvos, and you work and you work, and hopefully you achieve certain levels. It is very disheartening to discover, as sometimes we do discover, how easy it is to lose what you've gained. Things that may have taken months to gain, you can lose in two weeks very, very easily. Right? So uh, Ruchnius is, in a sense, although Ruchnius is ultimate reality, but because it represents purity, then any type of contamination can drag it down. When you have something that's extremely pure, then even the smallest amount of impurity can taint it, can degrade it, can drag it, drag it down. Now, um, if you're asking me, is that a function of, of today? Well, no, this was a perpetual problem throughout the history of the Jewish people. But I think it's fair to say that we have more distractions today than we had, simply because, <laughs> you know, we live in really the most affluent society of history. Uh, you know, when people are scrounging around to, for bread, maybe their mind is not so much on God as it should be. But at least they're not feeding the Eitzahara so much. They're involved in working, they're involved in survival, they're involved in basic operations. But now, where we, Baruch Hashem, we have uh, a relative life that gives us free time, and of course we have the internet, we have, in fact, uh, again, I'm not, uh, I mean, I'm not gonna give you a whole speech against the internet. I mean, I use the internet, some of my best friends use the internet, you know. So I'm not gonna give you the Eretz Yisrael wall poster speech. But, but just as a matter of logic, although, again, something like the internet is very, very useful for a lot of things, no question about it. But, you know, uh, it can also be a tremendous force for negativity. And I, I, well, in the extreme sense, pornography and all that stuff, things that, you know, you had to, used to go out to try to find those things. Now, in the comfort of your home, the world can be brought in. Everything in the world can be brought in. But even putting aside the, you know, pornography and all the real, real bad stuff, just the wasting of time, the surfing, where you can't concentrate on anything because you constantly have to go from link to link to link to link. So the notion of the distractions and the entertainments that we have is much greater today than it ever was. And therefore, the Yetzirahs are greater. In fact, the Chavitz Chaim, of course, who lived before all of this technology, was once asked a good question. He says, um, you know, we're supposed to work for the coming of Mashiach. We're supposed to bring Mashiach. So we asked the Kasha, if all of the earlier generations who were so much greater than us, they didn't bring the Geula, then how can we possibly imagine that we can bring the Geula? I mean, it's a Kal v'chomer. If the Vilna Gaon, Rebbe Kibeger, the Tanoim, the Amoraim, and of course I would add the Chavitz couldn't bring Mashiach. So what on earth are we supposed to be able to do? So there actually are two answers to that question. The first answer, I don't, I don't think the Chavitz Chaim gave, the first answer is, it's not the Pshat we bring Mashiach. It's, it's, the, his, it's the totality of Am Yisrael. So they did 99.9% .9 of the work. So it's not that we are the ones that are going to bring Mashiach. We have relatively little to do. They did the vast majority of it, we got to do the little bit that makes the difference. So yeah, we're much inferior to them, but we have actually much less to do. That's answer number one. But the actual answer the Chafetz Chaim gave really is addressing your question. The Chafetz Chaim said that when Hashem evaluates the value of our mitzvahs and the value of our accomplishments, he's not just looking objectively at what we're doing. He's looking at what we're doing despite our limitations, despite our distractions, despite our averus. There is what you might call the handicapping of mitzvahs, so to speak. So, therefore, it may very well be that one blot of Gemara that we learned today may be equal to 500 blot of Gemara that was learned hundreds of years ago. Because the very fact that they were on a higher madrega gave them kochos that we don't have. 
So therefore, yeah, we're far inferior. Our mitzvahs are much less, but they may count for more precisely because we have so many nisyonos mm -hmm. that the earlier generations didn't, didn't have. And therefore, a mitzvah today can actually count much more than a mitzvah that was done at a time of Kedusha and, and the like. Yeah. Um, as far as I understand it, when uh, the New World was discovered and with it, uh, the cocoa plant, there was a machlokas at the time in the post game whether or not it was mutter to eat, you know, chocolate and, you know, cocoa products because, as far as, far as I understand it, the cocoa plant was used for a bodhisattva by the Aztecs. So, according to the, but I don't understand the, I don't understand the problem because it's not the entire species that was used for a bodhisattva, it was individual plants. So, why would that usher the entire species? Yeah, yeah. I, actually, I thought you were going to ask me a different question, which I will also mention. But, but that, that's fascinating. I, I, you know, I, I actually have not even heard that before, that that someone to do Asher, the cocoa plant, uh, because of Avodah uh, Zarah. Number one, you are one hundred percent correct that even if there would be an idea that because the tree was worshipped, it would be Asher Bahana, uh, you're not allowed to get benefit from idolatry. That would only be true for an actual tree that was worshipped. That would not passel other trees that were not worshipped, unless they were planted for that purpose. And there are wild cocoa trees. Now maybe the cheshben was that since you cannot tell which is wild and which were planted for idolatry, so even if we assume only a minority were planted for idolatry, but Avodah may not be nullified in a majority, so therefore you'd have to be choshesh, even one out of a thousand. So that might be an interesting possibility. Of course, let me just uh, remind you of the laws of Avodah Zara. Generally speaking, anything that is mechubar lakarka does not get osir if it's worshipped. So for example, if a non-Jew bows down to a tree, uh, it does not become forbidden by Hanah unless it was planted to be worshipped. So that which the Torah talks about in Asherah, it doesn't just mean a worshipped tree. A worshipped tree would in fact not be Usher. What would make it Usher is it was planted to be worshipped. Okay, so a guy that would stand bow down to a tree, it wouldn't be Usher. But okay, but still, I guess the argument is that they feel some of those trees were planted. You know, I don't think that's accurate. I don't think they, the Aztecs, you know, planted these trees. I, I think may, may, at most, maybe they worshipped wild trees. And if that would be the case, it wouldn't be a problem. Now, I thought you were going to mention another issue, which I'll mention just as an aside. And that is, there was a big shaila what bracha you make on chocolate. Uh, because indeed, uh, cocoa uh, is, a, uh, is, the cocoa seed is a fruit. Uh, the fruit is... Uh, uh, I don't know if it's the seeds or the fruit itself. I don't remember. I think it's, I think it's the seeds, per se, but they're ground up into powder, and you make uh, chocolate out of it, or you make cocoa powder out of it. Now, since that is the way it's eaten, because nobody just eats cocoa berries or, or whatever it's called, so technically, many would say that the bracha on chocolate should be bore priho eats, because that is the way the fruit is eaten. Right? So uh, many early poskim took the position that uh, chocolate should be bore prio eighth. Eventually, the consensus was that because it's been processed so much, so it's no longer recognizable as a fruit, uh, we make shahakal. But still, it's brought down that the chasam sofer, as an eight-year-old child, eight-year-old child, loved chocolate. You know, kids love chocolate. Adults love chocolate, too. Uh, the Hassam Seifer stopped eating chocolate unless it was in the middle of a bread meal and he would eat it with bread because the Hassam Seifer, as an eight-year-old, came to the conclusion that there was a suffake if the bracha is shahakol or ha'etz and he only wanted to eat it betoch ha'suda. But, but even betoch ha'suda, he couldn't eat it as a dessert because that would raise the same question. But, so he would only eat it with bread, like a chocolate uh, sandwich or something something of that nature. So you see that even as a small a child, uh, the Hassam Seifer had a godless in Tyre and Yerushimai. Yeah. So I never understood this concept of the Tembosh tribes. How did that happen? Where do they, where do they go? <laughs> yeah. Like, that is a massive amount of people. Yeah, the Ten Lost Tribes, yeah. Uh, what, 
what's the story with the 10 lost tribes? The truth is a lot, a lot of it, we don't know what the story, that's why they're lost. But uh, the story of the 10 lost tribes is based on uh, the book of Malachim and the book of Divrei Hayamim, uh, in which there were two kingdoms after Shlomo HaMelech died. Uh, he was the last Jewish king that ruled over a unified Jewish people. Shlomo HaMelech's son was Rechavam, and uh, Rechavam tried to be oppressive. And because of this, 10 tribes separated. They revolted, secession, a civil war. And they, under Yeravam ben Nevat, they established a monarchy. So 10 tribes uh, had their own kingdom that was called Malchus Yisrael to the north. And what was left in the south was essentially Yerushalayim and the towns and villages around Yerushalayim and it was Yehuda and Binyamin. And the Davidic monarchy, therefore, only ruled over Yehuda and Binyamin, and then you had the ten tribes. Now, obviously, Kohanim and Levim were primarily in Malchus. Actually, they probably were more closer to three tribes because the Kohanim and the Levim were in Malchus, uh, Yehuda, but nevertheless, uh, we're not counting them. When, we, when we're counting the 12 tribes, we're not counting Shevet Levi, we're counting Ephraim and Manasseh as two. So therefore, 10 out of those 12 were north, two were south, and uh, Kohanim and Levim were also primarily in the south. Uh, for those of you who study Tanakh, one of the very, very interesting questions is, where was Shevet Shimon? Now, now, why is there a problem with this? Because Shevet Shimon did not have their own separate portion of Eretz Israel, Shevet Shimon had a bunch of cities and towns that were located in the Chelek of Yehuda. Now, if the 10 tribes seceded, and that presumably includes Shimon as one of the 10 tribes, how could that be if Shimon's very territory was in the middle of Malchus Yehuda? So there's a bit of a puzzle uh, one possibility is it was like a Berlin Wall, somehow, uh, just like you had um, West Berlin in the middle of East Germany, so to speak, uh, like a little uh, enclave that Shimon had an enclave of Malchus Yisrael in Malchus Yehuda. Uh, the other interpretation is that Shimon abandoned its territory, that Shimon essentially left its cities and went north. But just be aware that there is a bit of a question of where do you put Shimon in all of this. Now, uh, over the years, um, there was mainly animosity between the two kingdoms. And in fact, all the way back to Yeruvah ben Nevat, who was the first of the kings, he prohibited, he had guards that did not allow the Jews of the ten tribes to go to the base of Mikdash. Literally, they were not allowed to go to the base of Mikdash. And he put up golden calves, Egle Zahav, in Shomron. Shomron was the capital of the northern kingdom and, and the like. Now, because these were two separate kingdoms, and the Davidic line of Malchus Beis David was only in Yehuda, not in, not in Malchus Yisrael, so as a result, uh, Malchus Yisrael was destroyed by Sancheriv, the king of Assyria, more than 100 years before the Chorban Beis HaMikdash. They were destroyed and they were exiled all over the world. I'll, I'll go back to where they might be today and the like. And then around a hundred or so years later came the Chorban Beis HaMikdash and the destruction of Malchus Yehuda. So the question, and then 70 years after that, the Malchus Yehuda Jews partially came back and they built a second temple. So the question is, what actually became of the lost 10 tribes. What happened to them? Yeah, when, as we know that they were dispersed 100 years before the Chorban, what happened? So the truth is, the Gemara itself has a number of different opinions. According to one opinion, Yirmiyo Hanavi brought the 10 tribes back to rejoin the Jewish people. So when there was the Chorban Beis Hamikdash, all 12 tribes were exiled and all 12 tribes came back. So according to that view, there really is no concept anymore of the lost 10 tribes. Everybody, everybody came back and went through the Gullahs, and uh, any one of us can be any one of those 12 tribes. According to an, the other view, though, however, the lost 10 tribes became mixed and assimilated among many, many nations. Ad Kedekach, 
that we simply don't know where they are. Now, that actually means there have been a number of crazy ideas. Some say the American Indians were the lost ten tribes. I mean, these are not Makairis in, uh, of Talmud e Chachamim, but these are speculations over the years. Others say the Vikings. Uh, others say uh, the Pashtuns of Afghanistan, who are practicing Muslims, but they fast on Yom Kippur, are descended from the ten tribes. The Radvaz, who was the one Godel, the Torah, says the Ethiopian Jews are from Shevet Dan, meaning they got dispersed all over the place. And some of them remained Jewish. Many of them, their identity got totally obliterated. So they are the lost uh, ten tribes. Uh, they are lost. There are other statements, not really Midrashim, but, uh, but from the medieval times, like medieval Midrashim, that talk about the ten tribes having their own kingdom somewhere in a faraway place. And there are different stories about representatives of that kingdom coming and talking about magnificent wealth. And the truth is, if you read these things, these are not Midrash. You have to understand that in the Middle Ages, sometimes there were different fables and different stories that they would call Midrash, but it's not a Midrash. It's not from Chazal. And a lot of these stories, it's very, very apparent that they are Baba Mises to give chizuk to Jews who are suffering. In other words, you're suffering under uh, Catholic oppression or crusades or whatever it is. So they tell you, beyond the river, the ten tribes have this magnificent kingdom in which everything is gold. You know, it's, it's clear that these were kind of stories that gave chizuk to people who are undergoing great oppression. So I think most understand that the ten tribes are simply lost, uh, and only when Mashiach comes, there'll be a unification. Now, I do want to clarify one thing, though. So, if you go with the idea that the ten tribes are lost, so you might come to the conclusion that anyone that's Jewish today is either from Yehuda, Binyamin, or a Kohen or Levi. You can't be from Shimon, you can't be from Issachar, because the lost ten tribes. That actually is not true for sure. Because even though the kingdom of the ten tribes was destroyed, and the bulk of their population was dispersed. In Malchus Yehuda, there were Jews from all of the tribes who had migrated for Parnassah or whatever it is. So by the time the Beis Hamikdash was destroyed, even if you don't accept the view that Yirmiyahu brought them back, there were remnants. So any one of you could be from any tribe. You could be a Reuben, a Shimon, a Yisachar, a Zephulun, because it was the kingdom of the ten tribes that was destroyed, not necessarily every last member of the ten tribes. And there were those who had migrated, those who were living in Eretz, Eretz Yehuda. Yeah. Um, so they said, the Gemara says a story about Pinchas ben Yair, that one time he was walking on the road and a lion attacked him. And after saying some Pasuk in Tehillim, a piece of meat fell from Shemayim. One piece like uh, attracted the lion and the other piece he brought to the Medrash. And he's like, is this kosher or not? And they decided that it was kosher because, and they, this is what they said, nothing treif is going to come from Shemayim. Yeah. So if that's true, then where do treif animals come from? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so it says nothing treif comes from Shemayim. You have to translate, translate that. That doesn't mean God does not create treif things. Of course God creates treif things. But it means if it comes miraculously, meaning God is sending you something from the sky, then he's going to be sure that that is kosher, right? So what he creates on earth, uh, you know, that's, that's defined by the Torah. What's yoreh min ha-shamayim, that has to be bedavka, uh, something like that. God is not going to, Hashem is not going to feed you treif uh, without knowing it, yeah. So there's this <coughs> phenomenon that's, that's, a, that's a very much popular, especially in the, the Tibumi world, they're called uh, Yoetzat Halacha. So I want to understand exactly, how did this start? And like, and what, how, can, like, how, did, like how can we have many sects, of course, that reject this idea? Yeah, 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 yeah. So here comes a possible hate mail topic. Uh, yeah, Yoetzat Halacha uh, is a word that means female halachic advisor, Yoetzat. The Yoetz is the male, Yoetzat Halacha. And uh, it is, uh, these are women who take courses and they're certified, primarily here in Yerushalayim. It's the uh, Women's School Nishmat. And uh, 
you know, they study Hilchos Nida and other related aspects, birth control, you know, different halachos that women would be concerned with. And uh, they are then uh, sent to go to different communities. Sometimes they work for shoals, they work under rabbis, sometimes they're independent advisors. And uh, a woman that has a shayla uh, about nida or whatever it is, uh, might, I mean, I'm just describing a program, I'm not endorsing it at all, uh, might go to the Yoetzet to ask uh, for this. So uh, the program was invented by Nishmat. I mean, it was invented by a school in Yerushalayim, and they've certified many, many women right now. It may be hundreds of women, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, the women are orthodox. Uh, they're sh Shomros, Toru, Mitzvos, and uh, the course is a fairly comprehensive course, mainly taught by male Rabbanim and, and, and post given the Zeti Liumi world. Uh, so Nishmat's rationale was the following. Besides the general idea that they want women to learn, uh, they pointed out that in the modern Orthodox world, and maybe even in the Haredi world, women were sometimes embarrassed to talk to a Rav about details of their intimate life. They didn't want to show their underwear to, uh, to, to a rabbi. They didn't want to talk about uh, sexual challenges. And it was thought, again, I'm just describing here, I'm not uh, endorsing. It was thought that a woman, many women would be more comfortable talking to a woman about these issues. Now, if women were not going to Rabbanim, <coughs> then it turned, they might be doing Averis. They might, by not even asking Shilas, that might be a pretty bad thing. Uh, because they may just simply make decisions on their own uh, without even telling their husband, and God forbid there may be Averos in terms of Nida, or the other way around. If they want to play it, well, if we don't know, let's be super machmir, that's also not great, because if you're super machmir in the laws of Nida beyond the halacha, then uh, you might have difficulty having children, you know, etc. So the problem was, if women were not comfortable, either they wind up not asking and breaking halacha, or they wind up not asking and they're stricter in halacha, which may affect uh, fertility and shalom bayit. So the rationale was, let's train a bunch of women who uh, will be knowledgeable in these halachos, and therefore women will be more comfortable in asking them shilas. Right, so that's the rationale, right? This is called the Yoetzet halacha. Now obviously, as you might expect, the Yoetzet program is much more popular in what we call modern Orthodox environments uh, than it would be in the yeshiva world, Hasidic world, I don't even have to say, but they, the, what's the Yoetzet, whatever, they probably <laughs> may not have heard of the term, uh, but whatever, whatever it is. Okay, so that's the program. So what's wrong with it? So first of all, let me, let me point out a very interesting thing. There is long and ancient precedent for women to be consulted in the Nida Shilas of women. This is the Hakdama of the Prisha. Rabbi Yeshua Falk HaKohen uh, wrote one of the great uh, commentaries on the tour. Right, any look at the tour. Uh, Prisha Drisha. Uh, Prisha is Pshat and Drisha is the pilpul, but uh, he's called the Bala Prisha. He also wrote the Sma. Sefer Mit Meir Senaim on Chesh and Mishpat. It was the first commentary on the Shulchan Aruch. In fact, historically, the Smas commentary kind of made the Shulchan Aruch accepted as the code of Jewish law because people started writing commentaries on it. Okay. But in the Hakdama of the Prisha, which was written by the sons of the Prisha, this goes back to the 1500s, they write a little bit about their mother. Uh, and they say, you know, it's a Zecher Nishmas, their father and their mother. So they write about how learned their mother was, that she was a tremendous expert in the laws of Nida, and women used to go to her for Psak Halacha and laws of Nida. So a precedent for the Yoetzet you actually have for the Hakdama. Now, the program itself emphasizes that the Yoetzet is there primarily for basic information. They also lecture on Taras and Mishpacha, which it, actually even in the Haredi world, women will lecture to women on Taras and Mishpacha. So Yoetzet does that as well. And the program emphasizes again and again and again and again that the Yoetzet has to have a relationship with a Rav who will pask in the more difficult Shilas and the like. A Yoetzet should not be a posik. So based on that description alone, based on this ideal description, I, I think there's really nothing, there's obviously nothing wrong with it. I mean, you're talking about a woman giving basic information, lecturing on Taras and Mishpacha, uh, connected to a Rav in which difficult Shilas are going to be forwarded. 
So what's the problem, right? Really, there is no problem. And as they say in the Hakdam of the Prisha, uh, apparently this was done. Sheilas Nashim. Ah, so the question becomes, if there's no problem, then why do people say there's a problem? Like, what's the problem if there's no problem? So the answer, once again, is the proverbial slippery slope argument. Because, you know, you're living in an environment where women are being ordained as rabbis, you know, within the left-wing Orthodox community. And for many, many people, lines get blurred. Oh, well, we have a Yoetzet. Why not have a rabbi? You know, why not have a chazanit? Uh, what's wrong with women reciting Sheva Brachas under the chuppah? Now, if a person is a little bit of a lamdin, they know there are differences here. Just because you do this doesn't mean you can do this. And in fact, a person might even say, what, what, what are you comparing? You know, this and that. These are two different things. It's like the old line they used to say, uh, if we could put a man on the moon, we could cure cancer. Well, you know, Lavdavka. You know, <laughs> they're kind of different, different things a little bit. <laughs> so, so the truth is, Bedavka, I would say, a ben yeshiva, should Bedavka see that the Yoetzet program is biyetsim, not bad. But the problem is that among the Hamonam, they kind of see this, oh, okay, women rabbis, etc. So therefore, some people are against the Yoetzet program because they feel it is a step towards the legitimation of women rabbis and women aid them and everything else. Now again, the program itself makes clear that that is not its intention. Okay. But in this world where people are constantly trying to change the boundaries, there has to be a, uh, some people feel there has to be a clear demarcation. So that's, that's kind of the controversy. Now, uh, I, I mean, I, I know a number of Yoatzets. I mean, I, I speak to them sometimes, I work with them. And, you know, th those that I know are very, very fine people and very learned people in, in this mixaya. I mean, again, they're, they're not learned in, in shas, but, you know, they were trained. They were trained in these specific types of questions. And uh, they work with the Rev. Now, another problem, though, with the Oetzet, which is an ad hominem problem, I, I hate to mention a little bit, uh, but there's, there is a personal aspect, is that a certain number enter into the program because of feminist inclinations, meaning they themselves view it as a step to becoming a rabbi. They're a bit more militant. Uh, they sometimes will give up the Bible. Well, what do you need a rabbi for? You know, I know it just as well. Now, that's not the majority, but there is a certain percentage. And uh, therefore, some say that puzzles the program. If you have that type of element that you're strengthening, there's going to be a problem. Okay, so the two issues basically are the general slippery slope argument and the specific, within a small group, the specific kind of milit militancy or the anti-rabbi thing that they may bring to, to bear. Yeah. There's another sentence. How could the Benjaminites take the women after the Civil War? It sounds like there was no one to give away the women since the brothers and fathers didn't know about it. Yeah, so this is referring to one of the saddest, greatest tragedies in the Jewish people, uh, and that is our own Civil War. And it's very inexplicable, very difficult to, to even understand how this could have happened. This is the incident of Pilegesh Begiva, the concubine in Giva. Giva was a town in Shevet Binyamin. It is written at the end of the Book of Shoftim, but in reality, Chazal proof that it actually happened much earlier. It actually is towards the beginning of the period of the Shoftim. Uh, if you remember the story, without going over every, every detail, uh, a woman was raped and uh, left to die uh, as a man was traveling with his concubine to the land of Binyamin. Um, the, uh, the Shvatim demanded that Shevet Binyamin extradite the wrongdoers to be judged as a crime against the Jewish people. It's very similar to the Civil War cessation crisis. Shevet Binyamin claimed that they have exclusive jurisdiction. They weren't going to extradite. A civil war was declared. It's really uh, 11 tribes against one, but even so, Shevet Binyamin was very, very fierce, but as one would expect, eventually Shevet Binyamin was defeated, uh, and uh, there were so few uh, Binyaminite survivors that there was an issue of who would they marry, uh, who, you know, etc. And uh, finally, uh, there was a marriage with remaining women, uh, because, oh, well, I'm sorry, I should, I should emphasize, the, 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 the other tribes made a vow, made a vow, that was it. They made a vow 
that no person shall give his daughter to a Binyaminite to marry. Which would have meant, since there weren't that many Binyaminite women, that would have meant a gradual extinction of the tribe. And that would have been a cosmic tragedy to kind of lose a whole tribe, which is why I indicated that the lost 10 tribes doesn't contradict that because we do have remnants. That's, that's part of the proof of what I said before. Uh, so indeed it is recorded that one of the simchas of the 15th of Av was that eventually this vow was lifted on the 15th of Av, X number of years after this event. Um, so, so I'm sorry, so the question was, how could they give their, the, the uh, women to Binyaminites? Who would give them if yeah. the fathers were killed? Yeah, I, if, I think it's if the, if the fathers uh, and it, it in, the psukim imply that the fathers and brothers don't know um, what's going on because that question is yeah. asked. Uh, so I think it's that there's no one to give away the. the so 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 one and answer. Like what if, and what if the women don't want to go, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, okay, well, uh, okay. So one answer is that once a girl is twelve, even if it's not twelve and a half, she's a naira. Although her father still has the right to marry her off, uh, she has the right to marry herself off as well. And at twelve and a half, that's absolutely the case. So I think the simplest answer would be that the girls in question uh, were, t were not Kitanos, they were 12 or 12 and a half. Uh, now, the issue of consent is a real one uh, because you do get the impression they were forced into it, but halakhically we'll have to assume they were forced into consenting. By, by that I mean to say, like, like many things in life, they didn't really want to do it, but they understood they had to do it, so, so they kind of went along with it in a begrudging way. I mean, that would have to be the assumption, I think. Okay. This is kind of a this is kind of a two part question, but they're they're related. So the first one is, is it considered not bital Torah to travel the world and see sites? Because as we as we've like quoted before, somewhere it says like, "Did you see my Alps?" Yeah, that's one thing. And then, <clears throat> kind of attached to that is. Of course, first was in Germany. He was pretty close to the Alps, but okay. Sure, rough <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> in the and then in the messianic era. It's un it, is it understood that all Jews will, will be in Eretz Israel? And if so, will there be any room for people to go on vacation? Yeah, uh, two very interesting questions. Uh, the first question is, is it Bittal Torah to travel? Uh, not for business and not for simchas. I want to travel. I want to see uh, Switzerland. I want to see the Alps. I want to see uh, uh, Rome, whatever, whatever it would be. Uh, but it's Bittal Torah. So it's interesting. First of all, let me, let me just point out, many of you have heard of the great uh, Gadol, the Chida. Chida is one of the most colorful, interesting Gadolim. Uh, Chida is an abbreviation. Rav Chaim Yosef David Azulai, a great Sephardic Gon, who lived in the 1700s. Uh, and the Chida wrote an enormous number of Svarim on everything. He wrote Svarim on Chumash, and on Shas, and on Shulchan Aruch, and on Kabbalah, and even Bibliographies. He wrote Shema Gedolim, which are biographies of Gedolim, and that also includes descriptions of Svarim. Uh, and uh, the Chidaz Parnasa, so to speak, was he was a Mashulach, meaning he was sent from Eretz Israel to go all over the, the world to kind of uh, collect money. You know, and as a result, he met many people. He did not come, I, I, well, yeah, he, I mean, the New World, America was not really settled then. You know, there wasn't anyone to get money from in America. The Indians are not going to give you beads or whatever, whatever it would be. But the Chida traveled all over Europe. And what's fascinating is that wherever the Chida went, he made a point of seeing the sites. So he went to the British Museum. I mean, he writes about all the different, he went to zoos to see the different types of animals. And it's fascinating, in addition to his many svarim, the Chida gives us travel journals of all the different things that he sees. So at least on that level, the notion of looking at things to, to understand Hashem's world in a better way was not per se considered to be bittel uh, Torah. But on the other hand, I think everything has to be a measure, meaning there's a difference between saying, oh, I'm in London for two days, so maybe I'll check out the British Museum, versus I'm going to travel to London because I want to see the British Museum. I mean, at some point, the traveling itself may be a tremendous bit Torah, unless you take advantage of learning on the plane or, 
or whatever it is. So the etzem concept of the niflos habayre, looking at the wonders of the world as a way of strengthening amuna, is a good and useful thing to do, but you have to factor it in and not over-prioritize it, as we sometimes, as we sometimes do. Uh, when Mashiach comes, so it is said that all of the Jews will live in Eretz Yisrael. Uh, some of them will be dragged here. They won't necessarily want to do it, but it says that uh, we will live in Eretz Yisrael. So the question is, once we're here in Eretz Yisrael, will there be a post-Messianic travel? Uh, says, I want to go to the Alps. I want to see Switzerland. You know, can I, uh, can I do that? Will there be recreational travel once Mashiach comes? You know, I, I honestly don't know. Uh, let me just point out an, an interesting thing that's a little chomwar. Forget about Mashiach for a moment. And forget about even Bittal Torah. There, is, there are halachas about when you're allowed to leave the land of Israel. So let's ask a very simple question. Am I allowed to leave Eretz Yisrael to travel? I want to see Switzerland. Again, factor out Bittal Torah. Just stop. What about the Yisr of leaving? The Babaji Rebbe used to say, when people would ask the Babaji Rebbe, why didn't he visit Eretzel? He'd say, he said, even if I visited, I wouldn't be allowed to leave. Okay, so many say that's not halacha. I mean, if you came on a trip, you're allowed to leave. But once you live here, there are halachas, you're not allowed to leave. So, you're allowed to leave for a lot of reasons. If keep it of the aim, the Tzorich Mitzvah, you can leave. You can leave on business. You can leave for family, simchas for Shalom Bayez. So there are heterim, although many people are very strict. If Shlomo Zalman Orbach uh, prided himself that he never left Eretz Yisrael in his lifetime, including missing the weddings of his children in London and the like. Okay. But even if we give you a heter for business and we give you a heter for kibbutz of the aim, Okay, and we give you a, a heter for simchas, because that's a tzorich mitzvah, simchas chasen v'kala. But is there a heter for recreation, recreational travel? It's hard to see that why that would be mutter. Some poskim say like this, they say, if you're really burnt out and you're really exhausted, and this would charge, recharge your batteries, and you would come back with a lot of enthusiasm, so that makes it a tzorich mitzvah. And I say that's a kind of a stretch, but that, they, that makes it a tzorich mitzvah, and that will allow you to come. So obviously the Welt is makel on this. There are, there are you, know, you know, very from people who will, who will take trips uh, to Europe and the like. Uh, I see advertisements in uh, Jewish magazines about Pesach programs in Crete and in Greece and uh, um, in the Cyprus or whatever it is. There was even one, Egypt, spend Pesach in Mitzrayim. <laughs> well, there actually is a certain logic to that. You know, this was the first Pesach, go back to where it all began. You know? <laughs> but still, it's a little bit of a, an odd idea. I'm going to leave Eretz Yisrael, go to back to Mitzrayim to celebrate what you'd see as Mitzrayim. I go there to, to leave Mitzrayim uh, and, and the like. So the point is, recreational travel, Bichlal, is actually a much more serious shaila than people make of it, but uh, the Welt says that if you really need that type of rejuvenation, that would be uh, a, tzorich, a Tzorich Mitzvah. Now, some also want to say this. A lot of the tours now, there are all sorts of tours in Europe, uh, Torah tours, that go to the great cities, Krakow and Brisk and Vilna, and uh, the tour guides you know, teach about the Gedolim there. So some say, Mitzad, the tour guide, it's mutter, because this is the Tzorich Mitzvah of teaching Taira. And if this is how you could learn about it, that would be a Tzorich Mitzvah for you. So some will use Tzorich Mitzvah to legitimate the Jewish uh, tours uh, that they're offered if they're al Taira Yeah? Um, according to the Ramban, Anerich uh, Hashem is a, is a declaration, and it's not a, a Mitzvah per se. Um, if so, what's the meaning of the Gemara that says that the, Yis the Gemara says that Kali Yisrael heard Six hundred eleven mitzvahs from Moshe and two from Hashem. Yeah. According to this Ramban, which two did uh, Klal Yisrael hear from Hashem? Yeah, yeah. That's a very excellent question. Just to, to remind people of, of the Shaklo uh the statement of the first of the Eseres Hadibras, Anoichi Hashem Alekecha, 
Asher Hotseisicha Meyeretz Mitzrayim, right? I am the Lord your God who took you out of Mitzrayim. Uh, is that a mitzvah? Uh, you know, it's, it's not written as a mitzvah. Do this or don't do this. It's a statement. So Rambam, Maimonides, says, Anoichi Hashem Aleikecha is a mitzvah saseh to be maimon, to believe in the existence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's a mitzvah of emuna. Ramban says, that's not shaykh. How can you give a person a mitzvah of emuna? Mimanafshech, if he believes in God, he already believes in God, so the mitzvah is not doing anything. If he doesn't believe in God, then why should he believe in God? Because you say there's a mitzvah to believe in God. It's like going to an atheist and saying, you must believe in God. And the atheist says, why? He says, because God says so. <laughs> yeah. That's not an argument. So the Ramban, uh, I'm just repeating your question, the Ramban says, Anoichi Hashem Aleikecha cannot possibly be a mitzvah. It is simply a declaration that is the foundation of every other mitzvah. Since there is a God, therefore I am giving you the following commandments that you have to keep. Right? So the Ramban says, Anoichi is not a mitzvah, it's a statement. Now just to digress for a moment, how will the Rambam answer Ramban's taina? How can God give you a commandment of emuna? If you're not a maimon, what's the commandment telling you? So the MS is, the way the Rambam himself defines emuna, it is quite logical. Because the Rambam defines emuna as not simply believing because you were taught this way, and this is the Messiah from your parents, but to intellectually investigate the proofs for the existence of God. So essentially what the Torah is saying is, hey, you who believe in Hashem, you believe in Hashem, because that's what your father taught you, now you have a chiv, l'adasa Hashem, to have yidiyah. So like the Rambam's own definition, it's not so sure. Now, the kasha that you ask is a very excellent kasha. Uh, the Gemara in Makas tells us that there are 613 mitzvahs. So the Gemara asks, Ah, it says, Torah, tziva lanu Moshe. Moshe gave us Torah. Torah is begamatria, only 611 mitzvahs. So how could there be 613? So the one says, ah, Moshe gave us 611. But two of them we heard from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Hashem gave us two, then we got scared, and Moshe through Hashem, uh, and Hashem through Moshe, but we heard it from Moshe, gave us 611. And what are the two that we heard from Hashem? Anoichi and Lo Yielcha, the first two of the Aseris Hadibras. So like the Rambam, the Gemara is... Uh, great. These are, Anochi is a mitzvah. Like the Ramban, the kasha is, but Anochi is not a mitzvah. So if that's the case, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to have two mitzvahs of the Taryag that we heard from Hashem. Like the Ramban, Anochi is not one of those mitzvahs that we heard, uh, we heard from Hashem. Yeah, that, that is a very excellent kasha, and, and the, the Mephorshim say that is uh, an Iker Raya uh, to the sheet of the Rambam. Uh, the Ramban I believe, actually, it may address it himself. The Rambana says that uh, we don't paskin like that Gemara. He basically has other rayas, and he says that there may have been a Mandi Omar that looked at it as a mitzvah semuna, but we don't, we don't paskin that way. But uh, I don't think the Ramban himself gives a teret that that Gemara will fit his own sheet. But I, but I have to go back and look. This is the Hasagos, you know, the Ramban's Hasagos in the Sefer uh, Yeah. Is it, uh, uh, allowed to go into? A Buddhist temple. A Buddhist temple, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is a halach in the Gemara that uh, a Jew is not allowed to enter what is called a place of Avodah a place uh, where idols are actually worshipped. Uh, that is why we're very machmir, generally speaking, not even to go into a Christian church, because even though there are opinions that say Christianity is not idolatry for a guy. It's certainly idolatry for a Jew, and therefore we're not allowed to go in. Now, why aren't we allowed to go in? It's a drabana, it's not necessarily a doraisa, but it's a marisayan, uh, appearances. You know, you walk in, people don't know what you're going to be doing. So, the thing mm -hmm. is that uh, Buddhism, by and large, is considered to be idolatry. And therefore, to be nichnas into a Buddhist temple would, be, would fall within the category of not entering uh, a makam of a Now, 
This only applies to the actual makam of Avodah Zarah. Rabbi Moshe has a tshuva, for example, in many churches in the United States. Churches are commonly a polling place for voting. In the basement, not, not in the, right? So am I allowed to go into a church building to vote? Or a lot of churches have office space. So therapists work in churches, right? If I'm seeing a psychologist and he has his office in a church building, am I allowed to go? So Lamaisa, we do monitor it because, uh, especially if, you're to, if there are different entrances, that, that may be important, because that's not the makam where they have the actual sanctuary. Uh, people ask me about the Baha'i gardens. Right? Uh, now, the Baha'i faith is a little bit of an odd faith. You know, it's hard to even know what it is exactly. In fact, it's so, it's so recent. Baha'i, I think, was invented like in the 1920s or something. People, people think like, it goes back you know, thousands of years. No, it's like some guy broke off from Islam and just invented. So new religions can still be invented. It's interesting. I thought kind of the, it was over, but no, people can still come up with new things and get a, fa a following. So they have a Baha'i temple and they have a beautiful garden, uh, which you pay for. So it's around Haifa, it's in the near Haifa. So the question becomes, are you allowed to go to the Baha'i garden? So the Emma says, you are. Because once again, you're not going into the Makam of the sanctuary. So Buddhist temples, we would apply the same uh, paradigm too. Yeah. So there's a rabbi somewhere in the West Bank named Rabbi Bar David Bar Chaim. Mm. Sure you've heard Interesting guy, yeah. Yeah, I like listening to him. Yeah. I, definitely do not consider myself a follower of his, but a lot of my friends, all of whom, not coincidentally, are Bali Shuva, they follow him because they, I don't know, something yeah. to kick out of it. He seems like a very, very smart rabbi, he seems to know a lot, and he's sort of creating his own nusach in a lot of ways. Right, right, So my right. question is, one, is he allowed to do that, and two, how does one create a new Messiah? <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, again, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not here to really knock or criticize people. Uh, there is a rabbi, Rav David or David Bar Chaim, uh, who was born David Mandel, uh, and is a Brit. I think he's British. Uh, okay, I know, I know he has a, a British type accent. Okay, and um, I'm not sure if he is a Balshuva or not. Uh, my guess is probably is but he became like totally identified with Sephardic. In fact, he reads Hebrew like Yemenite, he even tells people that, you know, all of us should pronounce Hebrew like the Temanim, and he says, it's not so hard, I did it in like one day of practice, you know, etc. And he's a front person, you know, he's a, a knowledgeable person. Uh, he's, I would call him a Talmud Chacham. And uh, by and large, uh, the values that he espouses are Torah values. I mean, I, I think that the value system is a good uh, value system. But he has a particular thing that he says, we're no longer in Golos, we're in Eretz Yisrael, and therefore it's no longer proper to follow all of the customs of the Golos, and we have to kind of create, you know, Eretz Yisrael. So this has a lot of implications, like he wants to follow the Yushalmi, you know, instead of the Bavli. Uh, I think, I don't want to say for sure, I think he wants, he says we should have only one day of Rosh Hashanah, mm -hmm. uh, not two days of Rosh Hashanah. Uh, in, in, in Israel, in Israel, basically. Uh, we should get rid of Kitneos, because that's a hangover from Bavel uh, and, and the like. And he wants to say, when uh, the first day of Sukkos falls out on Shabbos, we should take Lulav and Ezra, which the mission actually says was done in Eretz Israel. It, uh, it got lost over the years. He says, we ought to go back to it. And he basically says, we ought to go back to the way things were done in Eretz Yisrael, the minog of Eretz Yisrael. Uh, and this would also involve the Nusach of Tefillah. I think, I think he put out a sitter called Nusach Eretz Yisrael, which is his own creation, but he creates it from different fragments of the Geniza and different uh, old old things. And his basic argument is that we're no longer, I mean, we're still in Gullus, we don't have a base of Mikdash, he, he acknowledges that, but, you know, we shouldn't be governed by the things that were developed outside of Eretz Yisrael. We should recognize that Eretz Yisrael is a unique divine experience. Okay. Um, I, I, mean, I hope I'm not being too persuasive about this, I mean, because I'm not, <laughs> I, I don't mean to, <laughs> I don't mean to convince anybody uh, to follow it. Problem is, once again, that uh, he's being an independent person. Now, 
We don't want people to be independent. No. Uh, <laughs> the thing is that uh, with all of his arguments, uh, the Gedolei Aposkim have not accepted it. And they basically said, we have minhagim, and we have to keep those minhagim. And, and, and for a yachid today to simply say, I want to do things differently than, that, than they've been done for hundreds and hundreds of years, is what is called a porate scatter, and he, uh, you're breaking down a fence. And even though, again, I, I'm not impugning him, I, I think he's sincere and I think he's learned. And in fact, everything he says has some textual proof. He doesn't just stomp say things. I mean, he has sources that back him up. But once again, there's a certain power to the minhagim of Klal Yisrael that shouldn't be easily discarded, meaning we're not just a text religion. We are also a minhag religion, meaning uh, we believe, maybe it's a mystical idea, that the minhagim that Klal Yisrael have gravitated to also represent a form of divine revelation in that way. So as a result, um, what can I say? I mean, I, 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 I hear his arguments. Uh, I, I don't think uh, the Gedolim have accepted them. So I guess, how does a Nosa get developed? Well, the answer is right now. I mean, originally, I mean, I mean, I mean my, my answer right now is we don't have the power to develop our own Nusach. That, that's what I'm saying. He doesn't have. But what we have. In other words, how, how did how did what we have get developed? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's the interesting question. The interesting question becomes, at what point did we lose our fluidity? I mean, that, that's actually a very excellent question because obviously there was a time in which different communities developed different things. Ashkenaz, Svard, within Ashkenaz, there actually were variants. Germany, Poland, within Svard, Moroccan, Temani, which is technically not even Svard, but whatever it is, etc. Et so there used to be, in the good old days, there used to be fluidity, there used to be change, there used to be diversity, different communities developed different things, but now we say, no more, we can't do changes anymore. It's a good question. Exactly when did things get locked up a little bit? It's a very good question. Uh, part of it is the Shulchan Aruch itself, meaning to say that's, that's exactly one of the implications of codification is there have been a long period of developments. Now we're going to concretize and kind of make a greater uniformity into Qal Yisrael. So the Shulchan Aruch might be the culprit. And indeed, I can get in trouble for this too, uh, this was the basis of the criticism of the Shulchan Aruch by people like the Marshal, they were contemporaries, Marshal and Maharal, that they felt that the Shulchan Aruch was putting a straitjacket on the ability of communities under their Rabbanim to kind of have different approaches to halacha. So there were people, there were great people, I mean, the Marshal, Maharal, I mean, these are Gaone, Gaone Olam, Mamish, who were not in favor of the project of the Shulchan Aruch. So you're right, and some have argued, well, you know, it's really, I mean, in, in essence, that's David Bar, Rev. David Bar Chaim's argument that, you know, we ought to go back to the independence of the Mara da Asra to be Machriya Halacha. And although I acknowledge there's some strength there, but uh, you don't do it. And again, I also want to add that this goes back to uh, our discussion of the Yoatzot, that is particularly when there are so many people who are using change as an excuse to violate halacha. So as a result, we become overcautious even for changes that might be within halacha because you're leading, lending credence to those who want to take down everything. That's the slippery slope argument. Yeah. Here's a sentence. <clears throat> we are very careful about zamanim today, down to the minute. Netzachama, Sof Zman, Kriyashima, Katzot, Shia. How did they know exactly what time it was in the time of Hazal? If you'll say they went by the sun, what did they do when the weather was very cloudy or so? Yeah, this is a very excellent question. I remember um, on um, one of the uh, years that I had my father's yard site, I had to go to a, a minion very, very early. I could, uh, so I went to a Vasikin minion. And the Vasikin minion, you know, what's Vasikin? Meaning you time it so that you begin the Shimona Esrei right with the rising of the sun. So what happened was, I think uh, I was 30 seconds late, and they told me I could never dive in for the Ahmed there again. I was 30 seconds late, I ruined the whole Vasikin minion. 
Now, obviously, what they had was, first of all, I, I think they missed the whole, of the whole atmosphere. No, the whole idea of a Sikh and Minyan is a new day, the sun is coming up and worshiping Hashem and you're joining with nature in the song to the Creator. Now here, we were in a windowless basement, so nobody saw the sun coming up and they had this atomic clock that was measuring things by tenths of seconds and they're staring at the clock. I think the, the meaning of Vasikin gets a little lost when you're fixated on a clock. And your point is 1,000% accurate, that obviously in the time of Chazal, time was not measured in that degree of accuracy. By definition, Vasikin was based on, no, the sun's coming up. We don't know the sun's coming up. There was no concept of um, time. Even with Tzitzel Kochavim, I mean, three stars, or three, you know, small stars. It wasn't, you know, this number of times, this number of times. They didn't work with minutes. They didn't have minutes, seconds. They were attuned to nature. Now, in many ways, that capacity has been atrophied. We're no longer so sensitive to the natural cycles of the sun and the moon and the stars, so we use clocks and the like. Now, your question then becomes, okay, so uh, if it was cloudy and you would not be able to determine the rising of the sun, so how were you Kovei uh, Azimanim? That, that, that is a good question. I mean, the assumption is, even in cloudy days, you can detect a light. I mean, the, even, even in a heavy cloud cover, the clouds are lighter. I mean, there's light, there's sunlight. So apparently, if you're attuned enough, you'll be able to determine a sunrise, even in a cloudy, even in a cloudy day. Uh, yeah? Um, why not start morning from the 9th of Tammuz since that's when, that's the beginning of the end, of, so to speak, in Sefer Malachim. Yeah, uh, ninth of Thomas, you think? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so again, let me just uh, clarify the question a little bit. Uh, tomorrow we have the fast of the 17th of Thomas, and one of the tragedies of the 17th of Thomas is that that is when the Romans broke through the wall of Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, after a three-year siege, culminating in the destruction of the temple three weeks later on the 9th of Av. Now the Gemara in Tainus asked the Kasha, how can you say this city was broken into on the 17th of Tammuz? In the book of Malachim it says it was broken into on the 9th of Tammuz. So the Gemara's answer is, the 9th of Tammuz is when, when the Babylonians broke into it in the first Beis Amikdash, and the 17th of Tammuz is when the Romans broke into it the second Beis Amikdash. So why do we go with the second? Because we go with the more recent tragedy that is closer to us, although by now it's been quite a long time. And why don't you do both? So do both. So the Gemara says that uh, there would be uh, only a week apart and that, that would be hard. Although we do have Yom Kippur and Zom Gedalia, but generally speaking, Chazal uh, didn't want to give us two fasts that are close to each other. Now I should also mention, that the primacy of Shiva's or Batamas as a fast day, in fact, I'm surprised the Gemara didn't give this as an answer, is because it is also the day that Moshe came down and broke the luchos of the Chedo Ego. That's miyuchat to the 17th of Thomas, not to the 9th of Thomas. So yeah, so uh, the short answer is that we go with the Mikdash Sheni rather than the Mikdash Rishen. But then why would we still fast on the 10th of Tevet and some Gedalia? The answer is because there is no second temple analog, meaning to say, when the same tragedy happened, the first temple and the second temple, we will commemorate the date of the second temple. Asara B'Teves is only connected to the first uh, temple. Uh, well, okay, okay, actually, uh, let me, okay. Yes, as your question is this, and actually your question is a good question, because your question is, uh, Asara B'Teves is when the Babylonians began their siege of Yerushalayim. Now, L'chaira, there was some date that the Romans began their siege of Yerushalayim. What date was that? I don't know. I'm, I'm sure Josephus tells us, but you know, it's, it's not even recorded in the Gemara. The Gemara does not even tell you the date that the Romans began their siege. So, your question is a good question. The question is, uh, if when it comes to breaching the city wall, we will go with the second rather than the first, then the same logic should apply to commemorating the beginning of the siege. We should go with the second, whatever date that is, I don't even know, uh, rather, than the, rather than the first. 
Now, Tzom Gedalia, I think, is not a question, because Tzom Gedalia was a unique tragedy that didn't necessarily correspond to anything that happened, in particular, the Second Temple. Um, that, that, is a, that is a good question. I, I will say this. The idea of the four fast days over the Chorban Beis HaMikdash, uh, Asar Beteves, Shiva Asar Betamos, Tishuav, and Tzom Gedalia, are prophetically mandated in the book of Zechariah. So it could very well be that you're limited to those months, meaning when it comes to Tammuz, where both tragedies happened in Tammuz, I'll go with the second. But apparently the beginning of the Roman siege did not happen in Tammuz. Or, or, or Tebe, Tebes. So as a result, you are kind of straitjacketed by the months that the Nabi Zechariah tells you now. It's still a question, why, why didn't the Navi himself incorporate that? But Lamaisa, uh, the, the fast of Thomas is called the fast of the fourth month, Nisan, Eir, Seban, Thomas. So, so technically, I think that would be the answer to that question. Yeah. Uh, where did the minna of any sectors of Judaism have to have very long pace, and is there any halachic uh, benefit of doing so? Yeah, the minhag are very long payas, uh, which uh, the Taimanim uh, had, uh, have uh, and the like, and many Hasidim have them as well. Now, obviously, the Torah prohibits cutting the payas with razor, but it does not require that they be a very, very long, long length. So the emiss is, uh, there actually is no clear makor for it. However, it is a very, very old practice that certain Jews had. The Rambam not endorsing the practice, but the Rambam records it in a letter that this was the minig of some people. And I, th I think the Rambam himself says he does not know what the Makor is. Uh, Kabbalistically, uh, the payas are kind of like a, almost a cable, like a USB cable to divine energies uh, that come down. So I'll pee Kabbalah, uh, there is uh, reasons for long, long payas. Uh, but I'll pee Halacha, there's no particular reason. As long as you don't violate the prohibition of cutting with a razor, uh, there is no particular reason why the payas would have to be long or, or distinct. Yeah? So I'm trying to understand the, the hetter for birth control. Why is it, why is it not considered uh, what you think seed? And why is it different than like, wearing protection? That, at that point, if it, if it why is it different than what? Than, like wearing the, like a... Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So again, uh, there, there are two things. With, when you consider birth control, uh, not abortion, we're talking about contraception. Uh, nothing to do with abortion. So there are two halachic issues that have to be considered. One is, hey, there's a mitzvah to have children. There's a mitzvah called pru or vu. How can you have birth control if there's a mitzvah to have children? But there's a second question, and that is, even if you fulfill that mitzvah or whatever it is, there is a prohibition against the wasting of zera the wasting of seed, that's why masturbation would be usher, zera levatala. So the question is, when there's contraception, is there a problem of zera levatala? So the aside of, of any hetra you have for birth control is uh, Rabbeinu Tam in Maseches Yuvamas. And Rabbeinu Tam uh, says that Marital tashmish itself, as he, he gives a raya, you're allowed to have tashmish with a zakena, a woman beyond menopause. You can have tashmish with an islandess, a woman who can't have children. And bichlal, a woman can only become pregnant a few days of month. So, most, you know, so how can I ever have relations with an islandess or a zakena? I'm being mighty zera levatala. So Rabbeinu Tam says, since the zera is nichnas into her guf, derech tashmish, in the manner of marital intercourse, that is not called levatala because the fulfillment of marital relations is in itself considered to be a tzayrech. That's a very, very important idea. That means Judaism considers the intimacy of husband and wife to be independently valuable, even if it doesn't lead to procreation. Now, the reason why, however, this would work only for something like female contraception, where she takes a pill or whatever it is. It would not work for a condom. A condom is generally going to be us there. It's because in the case of a condom, the zera does not enter her body. And that's critical. Rabbeinu Tam defines 
bia as the zera entering her body, even if it's not going to fertilize her egg and lead to pregnancy. The problem of a condom is that it's not derech tashmish. And if it's not derech tashmish, it is treated as levatola. Again, this is not so simple. Uh, there are postcom that say if the man has a communicable disease, like AIDS, but, but maybe even something that's not life-threatening, since the only way he could have tashmish without affecting the spouse is through a condom, some would allow a condom uh, derech tashmish there, but that's only because he couldn't have tashmish without the condom, you see? Uh, but to use a condom stomazoi for contraception would be usher, because if the zera is not entering the woman's body, that would be levatala. Okay, that's the difference. Even though there's no chetayitim, that's correct. Uh, again, again, let me explain this. Rabbeinu Tam's chiddush is that as long as it's derech bia, it is not levatala, even if there's no chance, even if there's no chance that a child is going to be born, because the definition of levatala is not only uh, whether or not it creates children, but if it's derech tashmish, uh, that's not levatala by definition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is about the uh, uh, davening. Uh, how can one face the challenge that uh, um, the, the text is uh, remain constant and uh, maintain the uh, and even if I take it further, how can one in, even increase the kavanah? There is a shita a way to increase the kavanah a long time. Yeah, so the question is uh, really a, a challenge that all of us face. Uh, we say the same words every day. We say the same words three times a day. Shmon Esrei. And how does one maintain kavana? You know, you're not improvising, you're not bringing in new things uh, and doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And sometimes it's very difficult to keep my kavana and certainly it may be more difficult to increase my levels of concentration uh, and, and, and the like. You know, it is a very, very excellent question and um, it's a challenge that everybody who davens uh, faces all the time. Uh, so one, one idea is, though, that you've got to prepare for davening, and unfortunately we don't take the time to do it. You know, the Gemara says that the Hasidim, or the Mishnah says, the Hasidim HaRishainim, the early pious people, would prepare a whole hour before they would daven. And that's before Shachris, before Mincha, before Ma'rif. So they had, uh, and they'd also decompress for an hour afterwards. And they davened for an hour. So it turns out they were davening nine hours, uh, nine hours a day. And the Gemara asks, when did they learn? They're davening nine hours a day. The answer is that they were so devoted to Hashem that Hashem blessed whatever time they had that they were matzliach. So part of it is you've got to prepare yourself. I mean, you've got to learn the meaning of the davening. There are commentaries, there are books, and you think about it. Uh, the other is you get into the habit outside of davening to speak to Hashem in your own words, to develop a personal relationship. You know, Breslov has... Uh, his bodhidus, you kind of go off by yourself. And we should have those habits because when you kind of connect to God in a personal, intimate way, then when you say the words of the Shemona Esrei, you feel you're actually talking to him as opposed to a ritual that, that you have to go through. But it takes work, it takes work. We're too uh, casual about it. We don't prepare our minds. We don't study the meaning of the prayers. We don't ask ourselves, what is it that I need? What is it that I want in this particular prayer? And therefore, that could also give me something to think about as I'm saying those words. But it is something we all have to work on. Yeah. Where does the word rabbi come from? As opposed to like rabbi, 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 rab, chacham. Where is it from a, from a source? And if not, why do we... Why do we, oh, why do we use the, uh, the, English, the English form rabbi? Right. Yeah, well, you're correct. I mean, obviously, uh, the pronunciation of the... Gemara or the Mishnah is either Rabbi or actually probably Ribi is more accurate, although Rabbi is the way we commonly, uh, commonly pronounce it. So where does Rabbi come from? Where does the long A come from? Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I just, it's just the English pronunciation. I don't, I don't know where you got it from. I do know that sometimes what, this is what people do. Uh, to distinguish Orthodox rabbis. Rav Arshi used to do this, you know. Uh, when he would be writing about a, uh, an Orthodox rabbi, he would say, Harav. 
And then when he had to, when he had to refer to a, a conservative or reform rabbi, he would spell out the word rabbi, Reish Aleph Beis Yud Yud, Rabbi. So he called them rabbi, but that's the difference. One is harav, and the other is rabbi. So rabbi is kind of a, you know, term of denigration, in in that way. But I don't know. I'll, I'll try to check into it. Yeah. Um, on the subject of uh, intermarriage, if one has a distant friend or a distant relative that one sees as, as, at the risk of intermarrying, how common it is, um, because this is, is such an important decision in one's life and um, such an important halakha, if one sees this kind of like a 50-50 chance, if I tell them this halakha, they're either going to maybe embrace or rebel, is it worth it to tell them this, or better just to stay out of it? If you're telling me there's a 50% chance, I would say go for it 100%. A 50% chance is a huge, that, that means there's a huge possibility you can make a difference that's monumental. Um, frankly, I'm a little, if that's your situation you're presenting, I'm a little surprised that that would be the situation because usually it, it's not that high a probability. But if you're lucky enough to kind of have a friend who could go either way, you have a tremendous mitzvah in getting him onto the right side. And I wish you, I don't know if you're, it's an actual case, but I wish you a lot of brach and hatzlach. Hashem should, should help you. Yeah. Uh, so we have nowadays um, a lot of things that are involved with Torah and Nefesh, like psychology and therapy and all these things, which I understand that all these things are relatively new. And they, many, many of these, they seem very essential to people's lives. So why didn't such things exist in previous previous uh, generations, like why is this only now? So, you, so you're talking about things that are coming from the Torah world? You're, you're not... Uh, necessarily. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so, so really there's kind of a big problem that we have all sorts of uh, fields that try to look into the human psyche, whether it's you know, psychology or the various energy healings or, or various explorations of human personality. And there are many insights, and uh, there are people out there who are spiritual gurus, and they're not even espousing religion, meaning uh, they're just generic human condition. You know, and these are people who attract thousands and thousands of people. They're spirituality without religion, etc. Uh, and the question becomes, though, that what you sometimes see in the Torah world, in the, in the religious world, Orthodox world, is people are using these insights, they're incorporating these categories, they're trying to use them as things that energize them in their avodah Hashem, even though a lot of the stuff may be coming from outside of traditional Torah sources. Uh, so there are really two separate problems we have here. Problem number one is to be sure that these are not principles that are against the Torah, meaning some of it might be treif, some of it might be, you know, avodah zorah, some of it might be kfira. That's a serious problem, and that's why, you know, you need a posek or someone who's familiar with both the halacha and these ideas. But problem number two, which I think is the main thing that you're asking, is, okay, let's assume there's nothing in there that's treif, but lemaise, it's not coming from the Torah, it's coming me bachutz, so should that be something that I use in the formulation of my avoda and my connection to HaKadosh Baruch In other words, even if there's like nothing that seems to be bad in it, but like the earlier generations didn't have it. Now the emesis, this was a partial, this was part of the critique the Chazinish had on the Muslim movement, right? No, we saw Slander started the Muslim movement, and uh, in the Eastern European yeshivos, it spread very, very quickly, Slobodka, Mir, etc. And the Chazinish was known to be a misnagate uh, to Musr. Now, he wasn't misnagate to Musr. I mean, Chazinish was not against good midos. Uh, that certainly wasn't the issue. But he was against certain aspects of the Musr program. Uh, one, I'll, I'll mention two very quickly. The first one, which is not Nogea Yershaila, was he thought that the introspection of Musr fostered depression and for some people accentuated uh, OCD characteristics. So he thought that it's sometimes better not to dig into yourself too much over and over and over and over and over. So he thought uh, it would be better to be simple and serve God with joy. But the other thing that he criticized was that some of the deeper Musr ideas were drawn from psychology, were drawn from 
uh, you know, secular sources or non-Torah sources, and he felt that it was not proper to bring into a Jewish framework ideas that came mibachutz. That was the second thing. Now, on the other hand, it is in fact the case that Musser in fact did that. I mean, that was the Ghaznish's yeah. critique. So apparently, uh, like the altar of Kelim and the Talmidim of Rabbi Yisrael were not so averse to that. I've mentioned a number of times that Rav Volba went as a young man. Uh, he was in Switzerland. Uh, he apprenticed him himself for a while with Jean Piaget, who was the world's uh, most eminent child psychologist, not sure psychiatrist, psychologist, because he wanted to study the moral develop or the development of morality in children. How do children develop morality? Because he thought that was Kadai as a Balmusser to understand how people develop Midos and the like. He went to Piaget, who was a guy. Piaget was a Christian. So this idea that you can take from the outside insights that you then bring into Torah uh, is, a, is a controversial idea, but it does have a, it does have a kiyum. Uh, in fact, some have said this is one of the great cont contributions that uh, many Bali Tshuva bring to Klal Yisrael. And that is, again, it's a funny thing to say, um, again, this may be a controversial thing. Let's say the guy comes from Buddhism, right? So Baruch Hashem, he's not a Buddhist anymore. Buddhism is Abayi Zara and Treif and everything else. But Lamaisa, it gave you certain perspectives on meditation and the like. Ah, so now you can take the Treif, bring it into a Torah framework, elevate it, and use it in positive ways. So in a sense, all of these Baal Shuvas bring in all the stuff that we wouldn't be allowed to explore, but they explored it so we can actually benefit from all of the stuff they explored that has some good aspects to it, even though we wouldn't have been allowed to touch it in that form. Right? So th that's kind of what's going on here. So I, I think it's large, it, it can be legitimate, but it is a dangerous thing. Now, your question, why didn't earlier generations have access to that wisdom? Yeah, I think the answer is Pashit, that this is a function of Niskat Nuhadiris, meaning when generations were stronger in their faith to God, they needed less of these aids to bolster them. As we get weaker and weaker and weaker, we need stronger medicine. That's why mysticism, Kabbalah, is learned more frequently in this generation than in other generations, because when you're in a darker place, you need a stronger light. When you're in a less dark place, you don't need a light that is so, so strong. So the fact that Hashem makes available new channels of reaching him is not necessarily mean that those are bad. It means that different generations need different approaches to our Kodesh Baruch. Okay? Yeah? Many moments in life we feel connected to Hashem and we assure that he is there with us. But then the next day we forget about that special moment. So the question is, how do you seize the moment and keep the connection to him? Yeah, so the question is that there are moments in life where you feel very connected to Hashem, but then the next day it's gone, and it's like it never happened. And the question is, how do you seize the moment? How do you hold on to that moment? And therefore, it should sustain you in the times when you don't have the same intensity of the feeling. Again, very, very excellent question, a difficult challenge. But this is one of the reasons why Hashem gave us memory, meaning to say you're going through a difficult time you feel that Hashem is abandoning you, Hashem doesn't care, or whatever it is. Remember the times that he was there. Remember the times that you felt it. Uh, sit, imagine, close your eyes, and know you've been here before, and Hashem has taken you out. This is really, what are Yom Tovim about, essentially? I mean, you're reliving Yitzias Mitzrayim, you're reliving Anonei HaKavai, Kriyas Yamsuf, Matan Torah. You're saying, these things happened, and on some level they will happen again, or they, they are still happening in, in, in other ways. That's why we have Yom Tovim. That's exactly the notion, that life sometimes, we have Aliyos, we go up, we go down. But we have to remember when we're going down that we're going to come up again. Okay, and that's why you have to remember. You have to, oh, you know, the problem is we have, you know, our memories for the negative are much more powerful than our memories for the positive. It's an interesting phenomenon. Like, you know, we remember the bad things a lot longer than we remember the good things. And part of our Avaida in life is to reverse that ratio. Remember the good at least as much as you remember the bad, if not more. Um, okay, I'm going to have to stop soon. Any last, uh, last question? Yeah. 
Um, so in Yiddishkeit, we, we often have seemingly conflicting um, or at least tempering ideas, uh, wh whether it be you know a, an idea in Musr that a person has to you know strive for an absolute level, while we might also find ideas where a person has to grow slowly and not and not be too hard on himself, or or you know another example might be uh, the Rebbe often likes to quote how the person has to have self-esteem, the person also has to have humility. We often in 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 Yoni Hashkafa and Musr find like like one extreme or thing in the svarim to strive for, but then also seemingly a conflicting or opposing thing. How do we, so how do we know how to live, being that we often see both sides? Yeah, well, the, the, the answer is exactly this. Uh, you have to balance. You have to learn from both. You know, when you learn Mishle, you'll actually see uh, two psukim next to each other that directly uh, contradict. Uh, one pasuk says, answer the fool according to his foolishness. And the next pasuk says, don't answer the fool according to his foolishness. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not even like you know, a different parak. It's, it's a one pasuk and then another pasuk. So what, what, what on earth is going on? The answer is that you have to know that MS sometimes incorporates two contradictory ideas. And you have to live with contradictions and figure out how to incorporate both of them in your life. Uh, just like the modesty and the self-esteem. And that's going to be true with everything. And this is what the Rambam says, the golden mean, going in the middle, taking the good from both, and using it to become, uh, to become stronger. Very, very difficult. It's a difficult challenge because we tend to embrace one thing or the other when the Torah, in fact, says you have to embrace both of those things. Okay? Okay, be well. Thank you for coming.